everyone. Welcome to another Higher Self Hypnosis session. My name is Tracy. I have my lovely client Ingrid here who has agreed for her session. If it makes it out to social media, it means I also thought it would be good and beneficial and helpful to everyone else. So if it's out here, then that means it turned out to be a really informative, helpful session for you. Not to say that it won't be for her, but um, there, there would be good things in here that you could learn how your higher self can work with. You can work with your higher self, which is you on how to get healing and downloads and upgrades and answers for yourself. So this is part one, the intake session. So pretending the camera's not even on now, Ingrid, this is where I get to learn all about you so that when you're under, we have, we're gonna come up with our list of questions, but to know how to follow up with them and know the issues going on with you, I might be like, oh, when your higher self answers a question, I might be like, oh, is that why she experiences blah, 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 right? Which if, if I don't know anything about you, I can't know that. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> let's jump right into it. Now, let me ask you this. In order of importance, I'm typing my notes, looking forward at my other screen. If there were one thing, we're gonna go to two, but let's go to one thing that you could change about your life or get a healing for or an answer to or change that would make the rest of your life so much better, what would that be? I have very severe complex PTSD. When you live with PTSD, it's a little bit different than what you're gonna see on TV where someone has something bad that happened to them and then they burst into rage or they have, there's a trope about this. Um, actually, PTSD is more like an adrenal malfunction. Mm -hmm. So your adrenal glands are releasing cortisone, which is the fight or flight hormone. And mm -hmm. instead of releasing it when you're actually in danger, they release it all the time. So your body is so taxed because fighting adrenaline and fighting cortisol is not a natural state of being, and it can really affect everything about you, including your relationships, uh, fear that you have, the, your ability to function in public, your ability to work, and also can affect you physically because cortisol is not good for your body and can really cause long-term health problems. So my main goal for today is to ask my higher self why I have this condition and to see if we can clear any of it away. Awesome. Okay. So, <clears throat> and I think we're going to come up with enough questions and issues that that's going to probably be, I'm, not to say that we're not going to get you healing for anything else because we talked about this off camera before the PTSD is up here and all this stuff underneath it that's contributing to it is all the stuff we're going to clear and heal so you're going to get like a ton of healing with the goal of having it alleviate or completely dissipate PTSD oh and also Ingrid you're going to get emails from me um, today you're going to get two emails from me today this is really important. So you're going to get two emails from me today. One is going to have the recording links from the intake and the hypnosis session and all the notes I'm going to be taking once you're under. Okay. And then it's going to have um, information about, you know, leaving me a review at any point, right? You might want to let it settle in for a while or whatever, leaving me a review. <clears throat> the second email is going to tell you, okay, you just finished that session. Here's your instructions for today and the next few days. Like this is how you wanna do self-care, aftercare. And then it's also gonna tell you once, so it, it, it's actually those, that email in particular is the one you really wanna read post session because it's this is coming directly from higher self. The instructions that you want to do, if you want to turn this session into a multi-month, and I, when I say multi-month, I mean six, seven month curriculum for yourself that will not just be a one session thing, but that will literally do everything you came for it to do, but you have to do the follow-up. And so without getting into the details of that, because it's all in the emails, you won't recognize yourself in six months if you do this. Like you literally won't recognize yourself. So having said that, that's hopefully that's motivation, but it, you have to do it. And it's really not, it's not that difficult. And you literally could do it 
in maybe 30 minutes a day, max 15, awesome. 30 minutes a day, right? So it's not something that has to take hours of your time. Maybe if you have a Saturday and you could spend an hour on it to include a meditate, a deeper meditation about it. Yeah, that would be great. Cause I know you got an eight year old and you work. So, um, but it doesn't have to take a lot of time. It just has to take consistent time. Okay. Okay. That's it. Um, so the email, the, the second email you're going to get from me today is the one that's going to tell you what your exercise for today is. Okay. And I'll just tell you really quickly. Um, one of the things in there that it tells you to do other than the self care, what you need to do for self care, it's going to tell you that don't listen to the recording today. Don't read the notes today. That starts tomorrow or beyond. Okay. okay. Today, what you want to do when you're done is you want to grab a paper or go on your computer or grab a journal and you want to write down everything you remember from the session. What sticks out the most in your mind from the session um, on there and what your higher self said about it? Because it might be slightly different than the way your higher self said it in the session, what you remember, what you typed down on the paper. But that's good because that's your higher self expanding a little bit more on it. So don't worry about it if it's not verbatim. Go, oh, I don't think my higher self said it that way. No, no, don't worry about it. Your, my higher self said this. And this is what I remember about it because you're going to be seeing and hearing things in your mind that you don't verbalize to me mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's just like in a meditation. Like, how do I explain this? Right? How do I, I, I couldn't get all the words out for what I was seeing or feeling, but when you journal it, those words might start coming out. So that's why you want to do it without listening to the recording first. You want to write down, so it might be easier to type it because then you can expand as much as you want. <clears throat> but that's your assignment for today. If you want to turn this into a curriculum where you want to recognize yourself in six months from now. And then the email you're going to get the day after is going to tell you how you're actually going to break this down into little bite size. Like I said, 15, 15 minute a day, bite size pieces to process it and continue the healing. Awesome. Sound good. <clears throat> so that's a new thing I just started doing. So you're one of the lucky ones. This is about my second week, just sending this email out and coming up with this little curriculum plan from higher selves. Um, so second thing, if you could he have a goal of healing, getting answers to, or clearing a second thing, what would that be? I want to heal and clear my son's pain and relationship with his biological father. And I want to protect him and I from the self-destructive behavior that dad exhibits and really create an aura of safety around myself and my child from the toxic behavior. You said create an aura of safety? Yes. Okay. So I want my son and I to be able to live our life um, unaffected by his choices and his moods and his substance abuse and all of the things that, you know, could cause really severe harm for my eight-year-old developmentally. Let me guess, he's a narcissist. He, I come from a family of narcissists. He's a narcissist who also has serious um, dependency issues, and he is deep in that at the moment. Yeah. So it's a lot for my son. He's coming to the point where he is able to see it and process it and is asking a lot of questions about his father's behavior and why his father's making those choices. Mm -hmm. And for my child and for myself, I just want our higher selves to be able to tell us and tell him that it has nothing to do with him and his father's choices are his father's choices and they have nothing to do with him and they cannot hurt him. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's that whole conversation about that. I have with my clients all the time about everyone chooses their own journey before they come here. We're all different souls on different paths, different levels. And we come down here wanting to experience different things. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> wow. Similarly, okay. my son is me 
you know, yeah. so any work that I do here, he and I share that DNA and those cells. Um, so I'm really hoping to kind of envelope our house, envelope our, our home, quote unquote, wherever we are together in that protection. Yeah. I love that. Okay. We'll be able to, <clears throat> we'll make sure we fit in at least a couple questions. If not, if we can't get to that. It's a lot already. I think, I think it's really critical that we get yeah. those in. Okay. I do. I feel like, yeah, we need to get some of that in. Um, but it's interesting because I have actually um, a gaslighting course coming up. Not that I don't know a lot about it. I do because I, yeah, I've had experience. Uh, my first husband and an ex-boyfriend that were narcissists. So, and yeah. Take the course. Mm -hmm. I've been in okay. therapy for years uh, for narcissistic abuse. And if you haven't, take the course, please. Yeah, I have the book I'm going to read first. It's called Gaslighting. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so, and then, then I take the class. Oh, I'm just talking to your viewers. I'm like, <laughs> take it. Oh yeah. 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 It's, it's from this place called P E S I and it's a, it's called, the course is called gaslighting. It's yeah. I've already, I've already kind of sped read the book. Now I'm going to go through a little bit more carefully, but oh my gosh, there was a lot of really good things in there and suggestions because, and I, I know, and I've learned through these sessions that the only way to deal with a narcissist, well, besides shielding yourself, protecting yourself, all that, right, is to um, not give them any energy. Gray stone. Mm -hmm. Right? You, you can't give them energy them. because that's yeah. what they feed off of, the right? The supply is the life. It's the mm -hmm. supply. And right. in you can even give them negative energy. They don't care. No, it's any energy. Any energy. They want the negative energy. They actually feed off of that. They love your anger. They love your rage. They love your frustration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have spent uh, the vast majority of my adulthood working on parsing out that emotionally. Unfortunately, my body blew it on parsing it out physically. Mm. So <laughs> we're going to work on that today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the book brought up really good topic that I, I wouldn't have thought of, but it was even talking about even if you have a narcissistic neighbor. Oh, yeah. Who causes you trouble. And it's like. Oh yeah. Wow. That's interesting, right? Yeah. It is the most dangerous relationship that you can be in because They're very dangerous. You, you yeah. don't know which kind you get. You don't know which flavor you're getting and mm -hmm. they will make you feel crazy. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, my dear, let's do this. So why don't you, and I know you said off camera that you have quite a bit of trauma from um, growing up. So without going like way into way into detail, because I really want to get to the PTSD stuff, but of course we have to know what's going on. Um, so start telling me about your life growing up, mom, dad, significant relationships, how those relationships were. Sure. Um, I have developmental PTSD. So we start day one when I was born. Um, my <laughs> parents were married very young and they were in a fundamentals Christian church. And this church was very traditional. We did not have a TV until I was nine. I was homeschooled. Um, it was a lot of patriarchy and putting the thumb on women. I wasn't allowed to cut my hair and I was expected to be extremely obedient to my father and other male um, authority figures, which guess what? Now I have a really big problem with male authority figures in my life. Um, but my father was and is a malignant narcissist. He's been diagnosed. And if you don't know, a malignant narcissist is not just a narcissist. They are a narcissist who gains power by hurting you. They will never leave you alone and they will never go away until they die. Um, my father did not like the fact that I was born female. He did not like the fact that my other sisters were born female. He wanted a son. He actually stormed out of the hospital when my younger sister was born without holding her because she was a girl. When I was nine, he had an affair with a woman from the church and he is still with this woman. I am 39. It's been 20 years. And this is when the behavior got really scary. Um, he did not want to leave my mom. And she made the mistake of leaving the narcissist. 
And so he became very violent and he would physically break into our home when we weren't there. He would yell and scream. He threw things at me. One time he threw a glass bottle at my head. Um, he was physically violent to his stepchildren with the new wife who were two weeks younger than me. They're two twins. And he was deep in substance abuse, specifically alcohol. And that continued. We were forced to have visitation with him for about three years every other weekend where it would be what new horror did we experience this weekend until he put his stepdaughter in the hospital. And that happened when I was 12. And we finally had CPS come and remove them from the home and remove my dad's custodial rights. Um, with myself, my older sister, and my younger sister. Um, during the time, you have two siblings, older and younger sister. <clears throat> yeah, my older sister is a narcissist. My younger sister also has PTSD. There tend to be two hold outcomes. On, hold on, I, I, I was writing the last one. Oh, sorry, you said about your sisters. Uh, my older sister is a narcissist. Ah, and my younger sister, like myself, has PTSD. If you start to look at narcissistic family structure, this is generally there's one of two options that the kids yeah. can go. I was just going to say, I can't imagine there'd be any other option. Yeah. So um, for me, the PTSD was very helpful as a child because I was able to feel when things were getting ratcheted up. I was able to correctly protect myself. That function in my brain was a good thing. It did keep me safe, um, but it just has continued to spiral and doesn't serve me anymore. Um, so I left for college. I didn't see my dad for about four years because he refused to go to therapy and he didn't want to see us, which actually was great. Uh, I left for college and then- Wait, hold on. So you were 12 when you didn't have to see- when you didn't have to see him anymore. So why was it only four years? I thought it would be more like six years. So he was able to see us at any time if he did the therapy and if he did the supervised visitation. He what? He was able to see us at any time if he did the therapy that the court ordered and if he did the supervised the supervised visitation. But I left for college when I was 16. You I was left at 16. Okay. Yeah, I was very I was very bright um and I left for college very early and I was done with college by the time I was 20. Um, my dad came back into my life when I went to college and he offered to help pay for it, which was huge. My family didn't have any money. Uh, I didn't have any money. And during the time that he was gone, he became much better at saying the right things and using the psychology that he learned because narcissists when they go to therapy they learn mm -hmm. how to manipulate you better yeah to manipulate me and bring me back into his life and my sisters as well but the volatility was still there it was just a different flavor of volatility it became more emotional abuse you know you're fat you're not making enough money. You're, you know, you need to do this school. There's no way you're going to succeed, et cetera. Um, and that went on off and on for a while until about 2008. And in 2008, I was 26. I lost my job in California after the financial crisis. I was working at Merrill Lynch. Obviously, <laughs> all of us lost our jobs. I was moving back to Washington and there was an incident between my father and his wife where he had attempted to kill her with a baseball bat and her neighbors found her outside in December with no clothes on and he was walking up and down the street with a baseball bat and she was bleeding and she had two black eyes, a broken nose. 
he had tried to push her out of the car on Highway 99, which is a, a street that you can go 45 miles an hour on. He tried to push her out of his Porsche and she ran out of the house and hid. And then the police were called and came to this incident. Of course, she didn't press charges. She never pressed charges. There were, she's um, of Russian descent and she just would say that's what men do, et cetera. So after that incident, I decided to never talk to my father again. And I began using the graystone method, which is not giving anything positive or negative and no communication. This was fine. And all through my marriage to my now ex-husband, I didn't get harassed by him. Um, even though he lived very close to me, he still does. But he's a coward. So after my marriage ended and it was just myself and my son, the, the stalking ratcheted way back up. And I was a woman alone. And so he would stand outside of my apartment for hours at a time. Your dad would? <clears throat> he has access to my social, secu social security number because he works in real estate. So he can pull my credit check at any time. I will never know. Mm -hmm. He knows where I'm working. He knows where I live. He knows what debt I hold. He knows where I shop. Um, and he started to send letters to my son who is his name is rex he's very cute he's a sweet sweet boy but he's the son that my father always wanted and he has no other boys in his grandchildren and so he is stalking myself and rex which includes leaving items on the front porch at my house and my ex-husband's house. He rented a vacation home right next to where his aunt, my son's aunt lives in a lake that he's never been to before because he knew my son would be there. Various um, escalation stalking behavior. Very scary. Um, we are stuck in this area because my ex-husband is forcing us to stay here with a court order. Um, he had agreed to let me relocate where my parents live, which would have been much safer, but he changed his mind. He didn't want us to relocate anymore. We were in court for over two years and cost me $100,000 in two years of pain. And now my son and I live about 20 minutes away from him. Um, together so 20 minutes away when you say him you mean dad i mean uh, my ex-husband ex -husband and my dad has well i live in seattle my my father became extremely wealthy during his time in real estate and he has about 40 rental properties in seattle so he's off and on between here and palm springs i don't really know when he's going to be here but it's it's whenever um so a lot of me thinks at any time he's just going to show up and shoot me in the face. And then a lot of me thinks that narcissistic people wouldn't risk jail time. So he won't. Um, but he did kidnap me when I was a child. And I do have a child that is the same age. And the, he wants this child more than anything in the world. He sees this child as his legacy, which to me is so bizarre to even imagine that you could think a kid you didn't even know or haven't met belongs to you and you're entitled to this child. Right. Wow. So what is, what is, does your son know any of what's going on with regard to your dad? Very little um, because he's only eight. He has known from the age of five when the stocking really got ratcheted up, that if someone tells you that they're Grandpa E, that this is not a nice person, we don't talk to them. And oh, so he doesn't have contact with Grandpa. Okay, okay. 
my grandpa E has left gifts for him, has sent him postcards, and I can intercept them here. But at my son's father's house, he's successfully been able to leave toys on the porch and notes. Excuse me. Okay. Wow. Okay. So your ex-husband, and we're going to get into him, but just this question for him right now, does he let your son see your dad or no? I don't believe he did before because my son would have told me, but I have a court order that says he cannot. That have, says he cannot what? My ex-husband cannot let my my son be around Grandpa E, period. Okay. Okay. Cost me a hundred thousand dollars, but I got that. <laughs> it's just worth it. Yeah. Oh, gosh, and I know the story already about your dad, about your ex-husband. So, wow, like, what in the world were you thinking when you decided to come down here and experience this, Ingrid? <laughs> right? That's what you're thinking, right? And I know. I'm like, what did I want to do this time? What was uh, I thinking? <laughs> I'm really running up against some restrictions and boundaries in this lifetime, but yeah. I don't feel bad for myself i have this house and a car and food and shelter like this is fine you know i don't i don't have time to, for self-pity yeah. um and that also doesn't help the ptsd because i don't like feeling those emotions so sometimes when they come up i'm like shut up shut up like what are you complaining about like stuff it back in you have everything you're you're yeah. blessed you know um lots and lots of just old school East Coast family, like suppression of emotions and like not deserving to feel sad, not deserving to feel pity for myself. Um, a lot of that. Right. Us moms do a great job with that. We put ourselves at the bottom of the list. Yeah, we're gonna get into that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, let me ask you this question, just a tiny detour in the middle of all of this. I think I know the answer, but because it's the same answer 99% of people give. So, um, <clears throat> first answer that first answer that comes to your head when I ask this question without thinking about it, do you fully and completely love yourself? No. Okay. I think that a lot of this is my fault and okay, I live well, with a lot of shame. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. Do you fully and completely trust creator or God? Yes. Do you fully and completely trust yourself? Mm, no. Okay. I mean, having PTSD is almost like being outside of your body okay. because your animal body is doing stuff. Your animal body is fighting or flighting. Mm -hmm. And this is like caveman level stuff. Mm -hmm. And then your body body is like, what the hell are they doing? Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost like you can watch yourself spiral into these behaviors of like either hiding. Like I literally will hide under blankets like a four-year-old if something's upsetting to me. Or I would write like a, you know, nasty email to try to like stop people from hurting me, lash out. Um, but it's almost like you're a third party to that behavior. Strange. Uh-huh. Yep. I wrote that down. Okay. So <clears throat> going back to my other one, do you fully and completely trust life? <clears throat> yes. Okay. So it's the self-trust and obviously trust of others. <laughs> All right. I don't even add, need to ask that one, <laughs> but you can't, but I don't ask that one anyway, because you can't trust others. If you can't trust yourself, because yeah. others comes with knowing who you should trust, trusting your own judgment of who you should trust. But anyway, so I don't even ask the, do you trust others one? Okay. So where is it at? I'm sorry. Where is it at with dad? Like right now in your life, like, have you seen him six months ago, a year ago? Like, what are his, 
what are his in the last, you know, five, six months, what are the attempts he's done toward you or your son? It's been a little quieter. Um, I've seen him and my sister, my younger sister keeps in contact with him for her own safety. So she'll be able to tell me if he's around, um, but she has a daughter. So she's not in the same kind of place that I'm in. He's not interested in her daughter. Uh -huh. um, so she'll be able to tell me if Grandpa E is in town or not. Um, he has not approached this home that I'm in currently. I've been here since December of last year. And I know he knows where I live, but he hasn't done anything to provoke lately. I don't know over at my ex-husband's. Narcissists are so weird. Like they can really only do one thing at a time. So if there's multiple children of a narcissistic, narcissistic parent, they can only focus on one of them at a time. Mm. It's so strange. And then they'll focus everything on this kid and then they'll drop that kid and then they'll focus everything on this kid and then they'll drop that kid and then it goes in cycles and in cycles. Yeah. I was to say cycles. Yeah. Okay. So it's been fairly quiet. So now it's October 24, <clears throat> 2022. So about 10 months, it's been pretty quiet on that front. Okay. Yeah. Yep. After the court order came out, um, I think that he is regrouping. And so which court order? The one that said that he cannot be around my son, whether it's with me or my ex. And oh, that okay. we have to immediately inform the authorities if he shows up. I think his plan was to infiltrate my ex's circle um, to get to my son. And now he has to make a new plan. I don't know what it is. Okay. So let me ask you this. When you were in court, was your dad in court there or how did you get this court order? It was through a very painful process because I had entered into an agreement with my ex-husband that would have allowed me to relocate with my son to be near my mom, who's a teacher for his first grade year where she could tutor him. And, you know, first grade on an iPad, it was heartbreaking. And then my ex decided the day that we were moving to say that I couldn't move. Uh. Um, and that created a massive, insane court battle. And part of the court battle was my ex-husband claiming that I was mentally unwell because of the stalking claims about my father. So I've had to go through two different guardian dead items and they both did their own investigation and i had to go through a nine month long psychiatry evaluation that i just completed because he's he told the court that i was insane and that this never happened um even though he was married to me for eight years and he knows exactly what it is so i completed the evaluation which said i am not insane and this is real all of them did. Um, so the court orders are recent, but it was a couple years of him just saying, oh, no, she's insane. That never happened. Um, fortunately, we're coming to the end of that. But talk about pain. That was <laughs> really painful. Okay. And so it's not a court order that was served on that. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting specific because I told you I worked in the court for 14 years, but it wasn't anything served on dad. It was just served on the ex. Well, the ex got served or notified by the, it's a court order that he can't allow the son around your dad. Correct. Correct. Okay. And so that must have been communicated to dad. He does have access to the paperwork. Um, cause he is, anyone can pull, it's a public file. Right. Right. However, serving a restraining order to a malignant narcissist is like inviting them to come over to your house. Right. So I have been advised by my psychiatrist to not do that unless it becomes apparent that it is needed. Uh, okay. So hold on. So you did. Okay. So that was my, that's where I'm trying to understand. You did get a restraining order against your dad. Okay, so I will. Dad being in court? My dad is not in court. He never showed up. 
Right. However, through the multiple allegations by my ex-husband that I was lying about it, and then the lengthy, lengthy right. <laughs> investigations yeah. that I had to take part in, it is at the bottom of our child support and our divorce decree and our custody agreement. It, there's a paragraph at the bottom that says, no adult may allow Rex to be around Grandpa E. And if they are, they must immediately alert the other adult um, and call the, the authorities. Okay, so it, uh, that was, and that I'm sorry, I was just trying to uh, explore. Oh, it's very that confusing. <laughs> no, so it was not a restraining order served on dad. So dad does not have an active restraining order against him. He does which not. Absolutely would cause a, a narcissist to lose their mind. Mm -hmm. um, which I totally agree and get that. So he was never served with it. He found out somehow that there is this, or we're assuming he found out somehow that there is this order for your ex-husband that he's not allowed to allow your son's dad around your dad. Right. Got it. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I got that clear. Okay. So, all right. Yeah, because your dad, your dad would have to be in court in order to have to get a restraining order. It would be horrible because it would be a mess. It would, it would antagonize him. Yeah, right. it would give him narcissistic supply. It yeah. would piss him off. Um, every restraining order we got against him as a child, he ran right through it. Like it, it was like you serve a restraining order and then they immediately come, like come to your house. So yeah. it's pretty dangerous to yeah. do that. It's better to not engage them at all and do yeah. the side the side work on totally the side agree. so did he leave it's probably an obvious question answer did he leave mom alone after mom left him but you said he broke into the house and you were still living at home so um so that had to be terrifying to see the way he went and harassed mom though right and that was probably a lot of the ptsd too right extremely volatile, extremely vindictive, um, swearing at her saying every day I can your life is a good day. Um, mm -hmm. financially abusive and mostly using us children as weapons. So very typical would be my biological father would fight for custody on a holiday, um, and insist that we were with him, say for Thanksgiving. And then the morning of Thanksgiving, he and his wife would be like, bye, we're going to Portland. And we would be in the house alone. And then my mom would have to find out. Some of us would call her on the landline and say, mommy, um, dad left to Portland. And she would have to come get us. So this went on, this type of abuse is still going on. He is still obsessed with my mom. He is up as as early as four or five years ago. He was insisting that she go to therapy with him. And my mom has been happily married for 22 years. She The last thing she wants is Grandpa E. And he cannot let it go. He wants her to engage in couples therapy with him 22 years later. <laughs> How about um, this question? And okay, so you, I have the benefit of, I guess I call it a benefit. <laughs> I have the benefit of having done hundreds and hundreds of sessions, hearing other people talk about narcissists and what's going on with them, and then hearing how their higher self responds and the possible expl explanation, so to speak, of why they these narcissists are the way they are which can shed a lot of light and actually almost feels like it's releasing chains once you can see things and know things about that person and their soul. So having said that, because I'm, I'm not going to assume, I have, I have ideas, which I'm not going to say because I want to taint your session, but um, of what might be going on here just based on other sessions. But um do you want to ask any questions for your knowledge and enlightenment about dad's soul as far as 
is he a dark energy like real like like almost or actually without a soul or something like that do you want to ask any questions like that oh, absolutely that would be very helpful okay 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 i was trying to be really gentle the way i said that wasn't i <laughs> is he satan himself like <laughs> Well, there's other things he could be too. <laughs> Let me just say that. Oh my God, it's not good. Whatever it is, it's not it's good. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we can definitely ask. Um, I I think that there is a reason that I have these physiological and adrenal issues. There's a reason that I'm being protected, quote unquote, by this PTSD response, um, and that it started in childhood. My spirit team went, holy sh to give her something um at that time so mom i'm thinking mom was are you the oldest i'm middle so the oldest we sister know, we know yeah. dad didn't just start being a narcissist when you were born so mom was likely living under tremendous abuse my mom's mom is a narcissist <gasps> Oh. You find that a lot when people marry narcissists. My grandma is an insane narcissist. She's not capable of the type of abuse, the physical abuse and terror that my father is because she is 98 pounds and five feet tall. However, my mom was the golden child of a narcissist parent. And if you know anything about narcissism, they can't have more than one kid. One kid is the golden child can do no wrong. The other kid is the goat. And so my mom was my mom's, my, her mother's golden child. My aunt was the goat. My mom married a man who treated her exactly the same as her mother. So she went out, she left one narcissistic relationship and moved into another narcissistic relationship. and the supply of energy for both her mother and for my biological father came from her and she's only recently been able to sit down and look at that and kind of start to parse through it it's it's a lot mm -hmm. it's a lot for her but she's doing the work mm. Um, and so mom, um, do you have contact with mom today? And how's that relationship? Mom and I are very, very close. We speak almost daily. She's super grandma. Um, we are becoming less mother, daughter, more friends. And we have a very strong relationship. She's supported me in every possible way that she can. And I do the same for her. she's a tough lady she's yeah and what about the guy she married is he he's a good guy he's a great guy so she married jim i call him dad he's been in my life for almost 25 years um he is definitely an acts of service type of person so he will come down to my house and fix things that are broken he will take my son and go play baseball with him. He carved pumpkins with my son this weekend, and he's a very good father figure for my son to have. And they are extremely stable. Their house is always the same. The decorations from last year, Halloween, are up now. And it's a very safe, good environment for my son. Okay, well, at least mom got a break out of that, right? Yeah, she said, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but now she has to watch him terrorize her children. So, you know, yeah. it's it sucks. Yeah. Um, okay, let's do this. I'm going to pause the recording for a minute. Okay, <laughs> we had a good conversation offline. <laughs> okay, <laughs> recording is back on. Okay, so we left off telling about mom and her new life and her... Um, husband that you call dad so that's where we left off but we talked about a couple things that you said you wanted to bring up and you wanted to bring up what did you write down 
So I wanted to bring up um, being able to connect with my spirit team as far as knowing a name or a word that I can call out to. Um, I have begun a Wiccan practice that I have, I'm in about two years, so I'm a baby Wiccan. Um, most people think of Wiccan as witchcraft, which is not. Actually, it's fascinating because Wiccanism, we don't have one deity and we don't even have a book. It is, if you decide that you're Wiccan, you're Wiccan. There's no barrier to entry. But mm -hmm. what we do as Wiccans is we we go outside and we are we are just like taking care of the earth and taking care of people. Do no harm and take care of the planet. So in the morning, you want to meet Apollo, the sun god, and say thank you for coming up and warming the earth. And then at night, you want to meet Gaia, the moon goddess, and say thank you for lighting up the night. Um, and I've been looking for names of other powerful members of my team beyond the deities that I can call forth when I am having a moment of sadness and weakness. Um, you know, kind of that person that you can call in when you're on your knees. And then also asking them if they think that my practice is going to help me in continuing in this practice. Mm. And which parts of the team can mo be most helpful to me in that practice? Because they might tell me, no, that practice is not even helping you. I don't know. <laughs> you never know. Right. right. Yeah. Who knows? Right. What's for you and your yeah. journey. Right. Oh, and then the other thing is, um, when you experience a lot of trauma, and I think a lot of people will be able to relate to this, you develop a really heightened sense of empathy because it keeps you safe. So if someone walks into the room with bad energy mm -hmm. and you know that this is a dangerous person, um, that's a safety, a, it originates as a safety mechanism. Um, so I'm highly empathic to the mm -hmm. point where I'm kind of clairsentient through, even through texts, I can tell where someone is and what's going on with them. Um, I can tell if they're in a bad mood or a good mood. And I want to either heal that part of myself if it is continuing to push the PTSD cycle. If I heal I what part of yourself, what do you mean? So, um, this is it's hard to explain. So when you are in PTSD, there's a hypervigilance that is protecting yourself. So I'm wondering, I want to ask my spirit team if that empathy that I'm feeling, that extra, extra, extra empathy is part of that hypervigilant cycle and that I don't need to worry about how everyone feels. I can just trust that I'm okay. That's one way that I look at it. Um, and then the second way that I look at it could be the hyper empathy that I feel is a powerful tool that I should continue to use and develop. So I wonder which part of this is toxic and a leftover from being scared all the time and which part of it is a gift and, and should I seek to expand that? Okay. Got it. I got it. Got it. I wrote that down. Okay. It's a hard one because it's like, yeah. I don't yeah. know. Okay. So now talking, okay. Now you, do you think you have PTSD also from the ex-husband, your son's father? So let's talk as briefly as we can about him. Um, because as always, we're going to run really late because I need like 30 minutes to put your questions together. Oh, no problem. Um, so I'll just yeah. run through that. Um, yeah. We'll call him K. K okay. is a he's an addict. He is has been an addict since I met him. He'll be an addict and in will, drugs and alcohol or both. All of the above. Um, okay. And so his, let me ask you this. So hold on, hold on. Before we go any further, you said he was when I met him. So why not? No judgment, like ever, ever, ever. Just FYI. <laughs> Okay, because we did what we did because it was the best we knew at the time, right? So there's no judgment about that. But I'm just wondering, where were you at that you were okay with that? So um, I have a significant father wound. And uh, okay. Kay is 14 years older than me. When I met him, I was 26. And he was 40. I 
did not know what was going on, but I did know that he had a nice house. He seemed to really like me. He wanted me to move in and that he always had fun activities that were always around drinking. So it was always the Christmas party, the Super Bowl party, always people at the house. Um, and I'm not going to blame my 26 year old self because that was a really hard, that was right after I stopped talking to my biological father forever. And it just felt like a safe place. And then as the relationship developed, I, I realized that he is extremely extroverted and wanted people to be around all the time in our house. And I was extremely introverted and felt like I had no space or privacy of my own. Um, so that became a rift. And when I got pregnant, we started sleeping in separate rooms, but he was consuming um, vodka, at least a fifth of vodka a day. He would pour it into a Diet Coke cup um, and then sip on that. And then if we were in a social environment, he would switch to beer because he just wanted to look like he had a few beers and he wouldn't tell anyone that I actually had a fifth of vodka too. Um, and then I left him and 2016 because I got pregnant and I stopped partying obviously and he didn't he just continued to do the exact same thing that he was doing so yeah I married him full well knowing what lifestyle he had but I think a lot of us have the delusion or hope that after you have a baby your partner would totally change and some do some step up um my partner did not at all. And his alcoholism since we've separated has just deteriorated. And it's it's bad. He has like a severe cirrhosis rash. He smells. He doesn't drive when he has my son, which I'm very grateful for. But I'm scared all the time when my son's there. And so I'm guessing he gets like every other weekend type of thing or what? He is quote unquote 50% custody, but it's more like 70% me. And then he is very controlling and he is very protective of his addiction. So when we went through court stuff, um, he hired this attorney who was the most aggressive attorney I've I had no idea. Um, and she slammed through, you know, no, he's not going to do drug testing. No, he's not going to do that. No, he's not going to do UAs. Um, he doesn't have a problem. Even though he went to rehab because he OD'd in 2017. Mm. And he was in a coma for 11 days from alcohol withdrawal. So he has a lot of enablers. Um, all of the relationships I had from that period are gone because I had decade long friendships. And the one thing that I asked them to do was to not use with my ex-husband because I want my son to have a father and I want him to be alive for my son. And they said, oh, sure. And then all of them kept partying with him and I cut all of them out of my life. And it was very painful because I don't want anything to do with his demise. Mm. And I just think it's so cruel for them to be doing this to my son, my eight-year-old. They don't care. You know, women and men that I was friends with. Okay. And so is he narcissistic? I thought you said, or no? Yeah, um, he's more of a covert narcissist. So he's very private. He doesn't talk about anything about himself. You will talk to him for all day. You'll realize that this person never told you one personal detail. Um, but he is the kind of person that will lash out and punish you in a way that you will 
not get in between him and what he wants, which is drinking. So the way that he reacts to my son, if my son says something to me about drinking, he blames my son, yells at my son, um, abuses my son verbally and calls him a liar. Um, but I think that that's mostly around the, the demons of his addiction. He is, without the addiction, a good person and a kind person, and he loves his son. So is he able to even hold a job having that much of an addiction or no? We don't know. Um, there was a period of time right before I left where he was selling a lot of drugs to make money and we never shared a bank account. We always filed separately, even though we were married, which is super weird. But when you look back at it, you're like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> he didn't want me to know any of that stuff. Um, so now he's in the real estate business. It's slowing down. So I'm not sure with the downturn of the economy, what's going to happen to him. We will see. He's never, ever been motivated or tried hard at anything. Mm. So, um, with regard to him, is he still harassing you or anything like that or no? Yeah, he doesn't want the truth to come out. And my son is getting older and older and things are happening that have to be talked about. Um, for example, he went to Mexico with some of his friends and he told me that he was leaving my son with his sister who is not a perfect childcare person, but she's, you know, she has it together. She's okay. And then my son called me at nine, like eight 30. And he said, I'm actually at my grandma's, my, my um, ex's mom's house and she's passed out and I can't get her to wake up and no one else is here. Mm. So I had to go pick him up at 8 30 at night and that caused a big problem with the family because they don't want anyone looking at their addiction and behavior so my son is going to continue to notice these things my grandma is passed out i can't wake her up she's been drinking wine she took her hearing aids out and my ex's reaction to that was telling my son he needed to apologize for leaving her house. But you're documenting all this, of course. <laughs> for legal purposes. Yes. Yes. And you know, my son and I talk a lot about his dad. And we talk a lot about how his dad didn't have a good mom or a good dad. And he never learned how to talk about his feelings. And it's not his fault that he can't do that. He is the best dad that he can be. But he didn't have anyone to help him be a good dad. And so my son is aware that dad is not perfect. Dad, dad's not an ideal dad. And he's also, you know, what I'm afraid of most for my son because my ex's dad dropped dead at 57 from drinking. My ex is 54. So I'm really concerned that he's gonna die or that my son will continue the cycle of that behavior from dad to son to grandson. Um, and that's really scary. So, but, but maybe your son is here to heal that generational pattern. I hope so. But I said also, whatever hope his that, path is, right? Yeah. But I hope that he doesn't. I don't want my son to be connected to his father in an abusive way as an adult, because I see his dad can be kind of parasitic. And if dad is not making any money, but dad is going to suck my son's time and energy away, move in with him, yep. 
my son's going to be caretaking. I really don't want him to have to do that. Can I, I don't know what I can do about it. Well, no, I, here's an idea. Um, how about little, starting with little kid things, the talk about a constant talk with your son about what boundaries are and how we, we set healthy boundaries with anyone and everyone in our life. And let me give you an example. It's the example they teach in school. Good touch, bad touch, right? I mean, that's just like an example of a boundary, yeah. right? We can start it at kid level. Not that it has to be good touch, bad touch, but do we allow anyone to talk to us like this? Do we allow another kid to just punch us or what do we do? And just using like lots of examples because it's putting stuff in their brains, <laughs> like in a, in a pot in a way to try to positively help him so that when he is older, he's got this foundation of being taught what a healthy boundary is. Cause like, I mean, my sessions are full of people who saw their mom or dad or whoever not have healthy boundaries, let alone them ever be taught what a boundary was or that you could even, that you could even have one. And if you could have one, how do you enforce it? Like, what does that look like? They've never, that gets a foreign concept, right? And that's like 90 some percent of the population, right? Cheating, right? Oh my God. We don't teach that. So it's like, well, let me change this and teach my son, just starting kid level, what it means and what it is to have a healthy boundary. Yeah. And how we don't have to be, there are other options of behavior. Yeah. Like, and that. it's even having them troubleshoot and be like, okay, so if this were the situation, what are some different options? you know, little Johnny or use an example of a story. What are some different options of what Johnny could have done besides allow that person to talk to him that way or touch him that way or treat him that way or be in that situation? What are some other things he could have done? Which one do you think would be the healthiest for him? Not no regard for what, what the other person might feel. That's the big thing in teaching boundaries. It doesn't matter what the other person thinks or feels or how they act. The boundary is not about them. The boundary is about protecting yourself and having healthy boundaries for us. It's not for the other person. Tracy, that brings up my PTSD and my constantly worrying about what other people are feeling and thinking. So I think I need to work on my own boundaries to show my son because when you are always worried about other people's reactions and feelings, I don't even think about myself when I meet someone. All I think about is, are they going to hurt me? Do they like me? I can't remember their name. I can't remember what people are wearing because I'm in a, a world of fear. So I think that if I work on that right. to show my son, yeah. because he doesn't have anyone to show him that. And I can't, I'm too scared of just the waking world. Do you have the, um, financial ability and do you have your son in therapy or no? Yeah, we, okay. So unfortunately the mental health crisis from COVID is just horrible. And my son has been on a wait list to get to therapy for a year. They're telling us that they'll have people aging out in December. Mm -hmm. So, cause last year he stopped eating for about a month and I was really upset by that and wanted to know what's going on. He's very introverted. He's very private. He's very sensitive. And so I called my doctor, she referred him to children's and they said, great, see him in a year. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well. We're in October, so hopefully he can get into therapy oh, soon. But yeah. That would be a good thing I would ask the therapist to address too. Yeah, and I hope that my son can tell. Boundaries. Yeah, he really wants to not be at his dad's house anymore. And I have been telling him like, okay, you're, it's your choice when you, you know, because I went to court already and the court said, you have to be at your dad's, but if you want to, you can tell people that your dad is drinking and you don't want to go home with him and they will call me and I'll pick you up. And he is terrified to do that because he doesn't want to upset his father. Mm. Even though he would love to do that. Sorry, delivery. My dog's going crazy. I don't know if you can hear it. Oh, I can't even hear it. Yeah, oh, good. Okay. Um, okay, so he's terrified to tell his mother when dad is drinking because 
of the repercussions from his dad, right? Yep. Yeah, dad has no problem blaming six, seven, eight year old for his behavior, for dad's behavior. So Rex really walks on eggshells around his father. Mm hmm. Which will, um, if he's not already, he probably is, but which will lead him to be a people pleaser and not have boundaries. Exactly. The two go hand in hand, being a people pleaser and not having boundaries, because you can't yeah. have boundaries. No. You're you taught don't. that you can't. Right. 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 So it's teaching him how to be in his power, not be a people pleaser by not caring what how anyone else reacts or what they say or do or think. That's his um, life. That would be very difficult. I mean, I see this as a multi-year journey for my son to yeah. do that. He's yeah. such a sensitive child. He always gets the kindness award in class. And I don't know if he wants to do it or if he's just kind of play acting, taking care of everyone. It's a weird thing because the teachers have, have said things like, this kid is following your son around and obviously bothering your son, but your son doesn't say anything about it. Because mm -hmm, he's not having boundaries. Nope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's that whole boundary teaching thing. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, 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 okay. Um, all right. And so where are we at right now? Just is this kind of the current picture of where it's at with ex-husband? Yeah. I mean, I honestly think that we have a lot that probably can't even get to <laughs> in the therapy situation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. um, yeah, ex-husband is a drunk. But he's steady. He lives in the same house. He, you know, walks my son to school because the school's close to him. When you and say he lives in the same house, you don't mean as you. No, 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 okay. no. He's lived in the same house for years. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. He on the surface is a steady person. So he is doing his best. Is it great? No. But it's what he can do. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and so the PTSD is, tell me exactly how that, I mean, you've given me a little bit of example so far. Like um, you said, when I meet someone, I ask, are they going to hurt me? And you live in a world of fear. So um, tell me a little bit more how you're affected by the PTSD, like what it looks like for you. It is going to be taking over my entire life. We are in a downward spiral right now with the PTSD symptoms because when I first started feeling this anxiety, it was when I was in my mid twenties and it was transient and it would come and go. And then as I got older, as mental health issues do, they stick around a little bit longer, they get a little bit stronger, but for me, PTSD is a loop and it's a self-fulfilling loop. So basically I'm tell myself that the world is a scary place full of people who are going to hurt me. I will meet someone and I don't know on purpose or not, that is a scary person that will hurt me. And then I will try to fix them and then I can't. So then I'm back to see the world is a scary place full of people who are going to hurt you. And I don't see it getting better unless I can really drop a lot of that fear. Because when you are in survival mode, you just do and see things that keep you there. And I have found myself, especially through COVID and especially through the last couple of years, I don't go out at night. I don't want to be around people. I am sitting at home alone because that's where I feel safe. And as someone who's 39 and single, I don't want to write myself off as a person who has no life and no activities. Um, but if you look at the trajectory of this mental health illness, this is really consistent with what happens to people. They just withdraw, shut down, say, oh, I'm an introvert and I don't need anyone. And I 
you know, need to control my interactions with people by, you know, keeping them far away from me and not really letting them know anything about me. And then if they screw up one time, I'm going to block them uh, okay, and cut them off because I'm scared of them, especially men. And I have convinced myself that they will hurt me verbally, physically, in any way. And you work from home, you said, right? I work from home. Yeah. Okay. okay. And you said um, before we went on the recording that this, is it a fear of men that spills over into your work or was just an issue you had with someone at work, which unfortunately we're not going to be able to get into that because there's already so many questions um, already. I know we're going to have, so we're going to try to fit in one session, but um, was it a fear of him or is just inappropriate action from someone at work? There was some inappropriate action. Um, the fear for me at work comes with when men get angry and okay. yell. Um, I work in a highly men oriented industry. I'm in tech. There are very few women and I have really serious triggers around men's anger. When I was a kid, if my dad yelled, that means I was getting hit or something else was about to go down. So if men raise their voice to me in any way at work, I shut down. Um, and I'm a powerful person at work. I have a powerful title. I am an influential person. And this is so stunting, you know, the, the idea that I'm going to shrivel into this little cocoon of fear mm -hmm. from something that I should be able to say, no, you don't get to talk to me like that. This is how, you know, we need to work together. Um, but it's been really hard on my career. Mm -hmm. Because once someone does that to you, you don't trust them anymore. And then when you lose trust, you stop communicating and it's a spiral. And so going back to the boundaries issue, do you say something to them or no? I don't think that, I think I've tried everything there, but what I've gotten constantly, the feedback is that I'm being sensitive and I'm being overdramatic. Mm -hmm. So I've learned to not do it. You're being gaslit at work. <laughs> like what the heck? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, I work, mean, and that corporate, corporate America, unfortunately, is a masculine energy. Like it's most very women, masculine. Most women that go around into this, them. yeah, they leave by the time they're 50. They just leave the industry in tech because it's so abusive and it's so bro culture. It's hard. It's a really hard industry. So I don't blame them. Um, um, so could you do what you do without working there and working more for yourself or on your own, or could you not? I have done that before and I was successful doing that, but I had the, I think we talked about this. I had like 50 employees, but the, the demand on me was so exhausting that I was working until midnight. And this is when my son was three. And his ex was in rehab or my ex was in rehab. So I have run my own company. I have run my business doing that. But right now I'm just kind of eating it because I need a paycheck. And at least I'm here in this room and I'm not in the room with the people that scare me. But um, I do. I, I need to be stable. I need to make money. And, and this industry pays a lot. Mm. So. There you go. Okay, got it. I know where I'm taking it, <clears throat> the question. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, I'm gonna pause the recording while I work on the question, so hold on. Okay, clarifying question. Can you pinpoint the first time you remember, not the first time, but the first time you remember just being completely like shocked 
at your dad's crazy behavior and what happened there? So one of the first memories is a piano recital with myself and my older sister. We were maybe four and five or five and six. And we were at a building, a white building with um, a big green lawn and there was kids going up and playing piano. And then there was, you know, the parents and all the kids were sitting in the front row and the parents would clap and they were done. And it was a normal piano recital. Uh And my sister played, I was sitting next to her and she was fidgeting. Um, She wasn't talking. She wasn't making any disturbing noises. She was just fidgeting with something. And my dad comes storming out of the back and grabs her arm, pulls her outside and starts spanking her in front of everyone at the recital. Everyone is upset and my sister's in tears. He walks her back, puts her on the chair and goes and sits down like nothing happened. And so tell me about you in that instance. How did you feel? What are you thinking? I was afraid. Um, I was not embarrassed because the fear was too strong. Um, I wasn't shocked because this had happened at home. But I remember viscerally, I have very few memories from childhood that are visceral. Most of my memories are a picture Mm -hmm. associated with a photo that I saw. I remember viscerally the stone walk, the white Mm -hmm. uh, door with the mirrors. It was a white mirrored French door. And I remember feeling his anger as he was coming up the aisle and feeling his anger as he was coming back into the building. I could feel him. And then I had to go play. Hmm. Okay, got that one. Where did the shock start? What was the first memory you have of being shocked? at his behavior? Um, This one were a couple incidences, but he never liked dogs. And we finally got a dog and her name was Poppy. And she was a normal dog. We had a big backyard. At this point in the intake session, my client started describing how her dad abused a dog of hers when she was a little girl named Poppy. And because we thought it might be too upsetting to viewers, we took that out. But just know that here she was talking about her father abusing her dog, Poppy, and how that impacted her as a little girl. And I wanted to include this so you would know that once we get to the hypnosis session, what we're referring to. It's her dog, Poppy, and her dad did abuse her dog, Poppy. And as a result, he suffered legal consequences with animal control. Enjoy the rest of the session. And then the one that was, there was two incidents that after he left that were super scary. Um, The one was the weekend after he left, my mom put all of his clothes in boxes and she put them in the garage so he could come pick them up. And we went out to dinner with my grandparents to a local restaurant. They drove down to help my mom. She was a mess. Three little girls. One was two. And while we were at the local restaurant, he tried to come back into the house, but she had changed the locks. He busted the door down. He broke the wooden door and he stole all of her belongings in black trash bags. He stole them? He couldn't find his clothes. He didn't understand why his clothes were not. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing because I'm not him, but he didn't understand why his clothes were not there. He didn't bother to look in the garage for his clothes. So... He didn't see anything of his, so he took all of my mom's belongings and put them in black trash bags and stole them. Mm -hmm. Did she ever get them back? Yeah, she got them back. 
um it was just a lot of drama because it was crazy like we so came how did so i know you can see yourself back in that time at that incident so were you standing there like like this or like how were you feeling you said shock right yeah i was shocked but i was like more catatonic measured um my shock has been quiet because if you're around someone who's really volatile you don't want to be noticed mm -hmm. and even though he wasn't there you know i had questions what happened and mommy 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 but it for the most part you're just staring at this like how is this possible mm. is this going to happen every day mm. is he going to break into the house what is he going to do why would he do that um and then there was one other incident that was really scary which was um when he was remodeling a house he had been they've been separated for a couple of years we were still going over there every other weekend and he was very intoxicated in the garage he was remodeling the house and he had been in a fight with his now wife and she knew he was angry so she grabbed me grabbed me around my shoulders and she said we're going to go out and talk to your dad but she was using me as a human shield because she grabbed me and pushed me out in front of her and he had a Snapple bottle glass and he threw it at us and it hit the wall three inches from my head mm -hmm. and she held me there so I couldn't leave. So, I mean, there's lots more, but those are the ones that I remember, like it was sea change, you know? We want him to die. <laughs> Family. We will dance on his grave. Okay, I'm going to pause it again because I got some good, good stuff from that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I just told you. I don't believe there's any way we're going to get be able to get anyway all through all this. But let's go through the questions so we can see what's here. Okay. Why did you show her the past life you just did? Because we're going to come out of a past life. What I'm going to do with you is, um, if it's okay with you, not go into a life in between lives and see what you do when you're in the spirit realm, just so that we can go from the past life and get right into all these questions, because that'll save us like a good 10 minutes or so that sure. we could use for questions. Okay. Yeah. Would it benefit her to go back in time, so to speak? This is a baby in the womb healing. Okay. When she was in utero, surround her with a protective bubble or shield that protects her from any toxins um, her mother may have ingested while pregnant and also shield her from her mother's emotions and traumas and stress and stress so that they can't reach Ingrid. And then also fill the inside of that bubble with unconditional love and light that saturate her body while in the womb and also also stays around her through the birthing process and around her during childhood so that she can draw upon those energies of unconditional love and light anytime she's not receiving them from her external environment and can you tell us what that process looks like as you do that now and do that now that you have gone back in in the past and done that i gotta change the wording a little bit just give me one second Looks like as you do it. Okay. Would it benefit her to have you take her before creator and ask creator to do a broken soul healing on her? And if yes, can you do that now? Tell us what it looks like as that happens. And then once it's done, tell us how her life will change and how that healing will impact her going forward. Like these so far? Is she yes. holding a trapped emotion? Okay, so here's the, we're dealing with your garden. There's, there's 
we're just going to call them weeds, the trauma and the shock and all that. We're going to call those weeds, okay? They're experiences, but we're just going to call them weeds for the sake of this illustration. We need to weed the garden. Before we can think, we're going to be able to plant more stuff in there because the weeds are just going to choke it out. Right. Okay. So we're going to pull stuff out of the garden before we plant new stuff in. So here's the pulling, okay? Because we do okay. the pulling first. Obviously, we, does, we don't go the other way around. Right. Is she holding a trapped emotion of anger in her body anywhere? And if yes, where is she holding it? What color is it? And is she ready to let it go? Or does she want to hold on to that for a bit longer? If she's ready to let it go, can you pull that from her now, send it to creator's light and replace it instead with unconditional love and light and tell us what that looks like as you do it. Okay. Good on that one. Yep. Same exact thing. Trapped emotion of resentment. Do you feel like you might be holding any resentment? No, no. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I can yeah. see the sarcasm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, then any other emotions you think you might be holding as a result of that whole fear. experience? A lot of fear. Okay. Fear. You're right. You're right. We're going to deal with that on different levels, but let's just okay. deal with it just as fear. Okay. okay. So thank you. We copy and paste. That could end up being multiple, multiple questions based on that, because you're, you're, if your higher self says, no, I'm going to be, what would it take for her to be ready? And yeah. then we got to heal all those yep. underlying yep. things, right? Hey, George, it's the UPS driver. Every day, multiple times a day. Boop, boop. Okay. So here's all the right, next one. We'll go to the office. Okay. okay. <laughs> I want to talk about her father now. Are there any energetic cords connecting her to her father? And if yes, is she ready to allow you to unattach those cords connecting to her to her father? If yes, can you cut those cords between the two of them, burn the ends, send those cords to creator's light and replace them with the energy of unconditional love and light with replace them with creators. Unconditional love and light and tell us what that looks like as you do it. Are there any soul fragments of hers that her father is still holding? And if yes, can we ask creator to bring them back, cleanse and clear them in creator's love and light, infuse them with a hundred times more love and light and return them back to her so they can be fully integrated into her soul. Is she holding any fragments from her father? Same thing, return them back to him. Did she choose to incarnate with her father? And if yes, why did she choose to incarnate with him? What lessons or experiences did she wanna have by incarnating with him, and did she master all of those lessons? If not, what do you got left to learn, okay? They got a dog named Poppy. This whole thing, just my heart is just broken over that story. Oh my gosh, this is gonna be a hard one for listeners to hear this Poppy story. So apologize to everyone because it, <laughs> if it hit you the way it hit me, and there are people who are way more empathic than me, um, I, got, I got kind of a tough shell, but especially, which is good for me doing this work, not to be tough, tough, but a little tougher than some people. So that might've really hit them hard. So let's get Poppy some healing, how about? They got a dog named Poppy and then I described that whole incident. Can you go back to that incident? Pull the shock from Poppy. Send that shock to Creator's Light. Pull the shock and pain from Poppy. Send that shock and pain to Creator's Light. Replace it at that time with the energy of calmness and also with unconditional love and light and tell us what that looks like as you do it. And then I say, you pulled the shock from that, the shock and pain from that instance. Now are you able to pull the trauma from her from that incident? Since we know Poppy is a soul, is there any healing that could be sent to the soul of Poppy that would be welcome or beneficial for Poppy? And if yes, can you do that now and tell us how that was received by Poppy? Is that good? Yeah. Poor baby. I know. <laughs> Are you able to work with Poppy's higher self and pull? Oh, I already did. <laughs> I did that one. Never mind. Okay, that was a different one. Okay, the weekend after her dad left, the whole thing about your mom and pulling the clothes and him stealing them. Um, can you go back to that incident and pull the shock? from Ingrid from that incident, send that shock to creator's light, replace it with the energy of calmness and also with unconditional love and light and tell us what that looks like as you do it. 
You pulled the shock from that instance. Now are you able to pull the trauma from that incident? Another incident was at the house where he was drunk in the garage and your stepmom, future stepmom, like all of that. Same thing. We pull it, shock, pulling that shock from that, replacing it with unconditional love and light, and then pulling the trauma. Um, and then the same thing for the piano recital. So we're going to do the same thing. So we're just going back and healing those memories because okay. you said those were the root memories that you had. Yep. Okay. Um, then. Hold on, pausing it one second. Sure. Okay. Has she, has she completely forgiven her father on all levels from the abuse she suffered at his hands? And if not, what would she have to do or be able to complete? What would she have to, what is, what is it in her? What is it in her that needs to be healed in order for her to be able to completely forgive him? Where is she holding any unforgiveness in her body? And can you pull that now? What can she do to keep her and her son protected from her father? What steps can she take either physic? What steps can she take physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually? Is there any other forgiveness she's holding in her body? Meaning toward anyone other than dad, right? And if mm -hmm. yes, who is she holding it toward? Um, where is she holding it? And who is she holding it toward? And is she ready to release it? If yes, can you pull it now, send it to Creator's Light, replace it with unconditional love and light, and tell us what that looks like as you do it. Is there any light in her father at all, or is he all darkness? Is what is he what we might call a dark entity, or is he a soul on a human journey that just wanted to have a dark experience in this lifetime? What can you tell us about him? And I won't tell you why I think that's, a, I'm glad you're okay with that question, because it's actually, it can be really healing and helpful. It yeah. literally, my client had a dad similar to yours. Like you guys' stories are almost identical. Sure. Um, yeah. And what her higher self showed her for her in her session literally snapped her completely out of it. Wow. Literally snapped her right out of all of it. Crazy. Because of it. When we ask that question, what her higher self showed her in her mind. And when we're done, if you want, you can join my Patreon channel. It's like $22 yeah. a month or something yeah. and see her session. Perfect. I think you might really like it. Okay. Right? Yeah. I know my mom would like to know too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you might really like it. And yours yeah. might be different than hers. I don't know. It sounds pretty darn similar. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same, yeah. but it, it yanked her right out of all of that trauma oh yeah crazy so it was pretty cool cool that it did that okay because of the trauma she experienced from her father she has ptsd where she tells herself the world is a scary place full of people who were hurt her and wonders if everyone she meet is scary she said she has she then tries to learn to fix other people and then of course she can't change others so then she says, see, the world is a scary place with people that hurt me. If you were to pinpoint the exact beginning, the initial ground zero trigger, so to speak, for all of this PTSD, what is that trigger exactly? And is it from this lifetime, another lifetime, something she's carrying from an ancestor, carried on a soul level? What is the exact trigger? Okay. Then we're going to work on healing that trigger. I have no idea what's going to be said. So no. I can't propose the questions yet. Okay. Now that we healed that initial trigger, is there anything else in her that needs to be healed in order for her to get out of this repeating loop that causes her so much pain and suffering and anxiety? She keeps people far away from her, and if they screw up one time, she blocks them, and she especially has a fear of men and, and has convinced herself that they will hurt her. What is it in her that needs to be healed in order to overcome this fear? As a result of PTSD, she's always in survival mode. This is a little bit of psychic surgery, okay? Yep. Um. Is her body in need of any healing from the ongoing stress she's placed on her body by being in fight or flight mode for much of her life and having excess amounts of cortisol released in her bloodstream? And if yes, are you able to send healing and balancing light and energy into her adrenal glands, blood vessels, cortisol receptors in her bloodstream, pituitary gland, or, and her hypothalamus, and also place an energetic regulator, so to speak, on her hypothalamus? It regulates the amount of cortisol it instructs her adrenal glands to release into the body 
so that it only instructs the body to release cortisol into the body for true life or death situations and not for every stressful event and tell us what that looks like as you do it. Do you like that? I love it. Let's hope then, I say yes. Yes. <laughs> then can you assign a psychic surgeon, healing master guide or angel to continuously monitor um, this regulator and these systems to make sure that they stay in perfect working order and make any adjustments or repairs as necessary so they remain balanced and functional for the remainder of her life on this planet and then tell us who you assign for this task and if there's anything she needs to do in this process. She's very empathic to the point where it seems like it's off balance. Are you able to install in her like an quote unquote empathy meter? I'm just grasping here. I've never asked for this, so let me just try. If you don't ask, you don't get it, so to speak. That is not tainted, as in it's brand new out of the box. One that has never been exposed to shock or trauma or drama that she can have attached to her mind that can help her filter out, sort out different emotions and events around her so that she can see events and people and things around her through the lens of that brand new unclouded empathy meter to aid her with emotional regulation in a healthy way. And if yes, can you do that for her now? Tell us what that looks like. Or if not that way, is there a different way you could take this request and do it for her? Okay. Yeah, we have no idea. Right? Right. Why not? Right? And let me just tell you, doing the homework that you're going to get in the email, the date tomorrow. Okay. That will help you not to undo anything you got in this session. So your higher self could literally come here and clean house for you and absolutely heal everything. Like, to the point where creator could, well, creator looks down and sees everything perfect anyway. Okay, so let's just say where your higher self could look at it and go, oh no, this is a clean house, right? But you literally, two seconds later, if that much, could undo everything your higher self just did. Sure. By discreating slash disbelieving any of it with yeah. one thought. Mm -hmm. So doing the homework that I'm emailing you tomorrow, that is what it's meant for primarily, not only for exponential growth, but to help you not discreate anything that's being created today. Okay. Yeah. Just one feeling of fear after that and going, oh, I need all that stuff. I need to hold on to it. Right. You know, you can, so, go, yeah. you can go grab it again anytime you want out of the dumpster. Uh -huh. Yeah, we don't need it. So, yeah. yeah. Would it benefit her to have you download creator's definition and perspective of safety into her and tell us what that looks like and then create an abundance of receptors in her cells for safety? And then teach her heart, mind, body, and emotions what it feels like to be safe and that she's able to be safe. Then would it benefit her and are you able to download creator's definition and perspective of peace and what it feels like from creator's perspective to live in peace? Tell us what that looks like. Create an abundance. Oh, we already did that one. Uh, one. Does she have any blocks or belief in her that would prevent her from being able to accept creator's definition and perspective of worthiness? Do you feel like you struggle with worthiness, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have to deal with all that. Like I had a woman the other day, we literally spent 30 minutes just pulling the blocks for her to even being able to receive creator's definition of worthiness. So we had to pull this long list of blocks, then download creator's definition and perspective of worthiness. Because if we didn't pull those weeds, you couldn't plant the new seed. Right. There's a, the unpacking is it could be big, it could be small, it could hijack the whole session. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I'm going to use your words. I'm going to use your words because I love them. Unpacking it all, it could hijack the session. <laughs> yeah. Not but really, okay. literally. Right. I mean, like, I think that that's, if you have an agenda as a, a person who's going to be healed, like, you have to give it over to what you're, you know, how yourself is focusing on and I'm using those words too. <laughs> yeah, like we can't come in here with an agenda for our higher self. That's our ego is doing it. Like this is not about us. We don't get to make a list of 10 things that we want accomplished. Yes. Right. Well, I'm so using your words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for like, being my teacher. <laughs> oh my God. This is the earth though. Like you made a plan. Ha <laughs> ha. Like, yeah, what they say about the best laid plans, yeah. right? Very cute. Right. Um, okay. So then we want to do all that. 
hopefully it won't take 30 minutes, but you never know, right? Ever, right? It could hijack the whole session. Right. But then we want to download creator's definition and perspective of worthiness. Then teach your heart, mind, body, and emotions what it feels like to be worthy. Then download the program, I Know How to Be Worthy. Then teach your heart, mind, body, and emotions um, how to walk in creator's definition of worthiness in your daily life. Then same question, same line. Are there any blocks preventing her from being able to accept creator's definition and perspective of self-love? If yes, we're going to deal with all that, right? Then can you teach her heart, mind, body, and emotions what it feels like to love herself and then that teach them that it knows how to love itself and then what are some things she can do to increase her self-love? What can she do to best support her son in this life so he's not thrown off his life path as a result of the actions of his father? What can she do to help him stay strong and learn to be in his own power? Okay. Right. What can she do or what does she need to know in order to be able to connect to her spirit team when she's feeling sad or weak or on her knees? She would really love a name or a keyword or something to refer to them by, but what can you tell her about this? Is her team supportive of her practice of Wiccan and is that a good path for her life or is there a different path she may want to pursue that would fit better with her purpose and her path? Are there any other messages you want to share before we end this session? And if she takes all the information from this session and incorporates it into her life, how will her life be different going forward compared to what it would have been like had she not done this session? You see, that's a lot. Uh -huh. So we're going to get to what we can get to. Yeah. Right? Let's just, you know, take it one yep. weed at a time. Yep. One weed at a time. We're going to pull what? One weed at a time. And we're yep. going to get to everything that we possibly can. Like I said, it depends on the pace your higher self moves or how much underlying stuff there is. I mean, if we need to spend an hour pulling out um, self love weeds, weeds underneath self love and unworthiness, that's an hour, right? Sounds like it's an hour spent, though, you know? Like, and it will be. It will be because. If we can't pull those weeds, you can't plant worthiness. You right. can't plant self-love. And if we don't, so if we don't pull them, it doesn't matter what you plant over top of it. If it's still underground, it's still going to choke out that new seed. So I'm here for the ride. We got to do the work. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is a good place to end part one. So we'll invite everyone back if this goes online to watch part two, where we'll be jumping right into a past life session. Okay. Okay.